Are you a first responder, a veteran, a doctor, a nurse, a teacher, or a Let's Go Blues radio listener? Of course you are. If you're in the market to buy or sell a home, call real estate superstar Mike Burgoyne today at 314-753-4060 or email him at mike at strikewithmike.com to earn special rates today. A proven winner on the hockey rink, Joe Wolf knows what it takes to be the best. That's why he has the best rates in the area and only has rave reviews of his work with Wolf Power Washing. Get that siding back to its original color with Joe. Call him at 314-420-5434. That's 314-420-5434. Hi, guys. This is Erica Weston with Valley Sports West. And you're listening to my favorite St. Louis Blues hockey podcast, Let's Go Blues Radio. I'm here for it. I'm here for all the hot takes. I, I totally see Hoffman putting up 30, 35 goals. Uh, In a 56 game season? Yeah. Hot take. You know, Jeff, you were saying you didn't think he was using more 20 goals next season. Uh, I still think that's that. a possible. I mean, I would literally be happy to grab a live pro and eat it if Tarasenko comes back and scores 30, 40 goals in the NHL in a season. With a last name like Boldu, he's not going to play for us. There's just something about that last name is not going to make the NHL on this team. Uh, in the in for the Blues, I just don't see it happening. It seems like a name that is not conducive to play in the NHL. Kurt Price is already making his claim that Zach Bolduke will never wear a Blues jersey in a regular season game. No. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 41 of season 13 of the original and longest-lasting blues hockey podcast, Let's Go Blues Radio. I'm Jeff Ponder, and this is episode number 472 all-time. Support for Let's Go Blues Radio is brought to you in part by Mike Burgoyne of Rio Brokerage Realty. Uh, contact Mike at MikeStrikeWithMike.com uh, or call him at 314-753-4060 and get started selling your current home or buying a new home today. And by Wolf Power Washing. If you're in the St. Louis area and need the services of a professional power washer, Joe Wolf is your guy. Call him at 314-420-5434 and get the best prices in the area. Uh, so again, welcome to the show. Uh, last week, if you listened, you probably heard me at the end of the episode say uh, that uh, we were going to have our friend Amanda Levier join us to talk about the last season in the pwhl and uh the championship season for pwhl minnesota but uh that's actually going to be next week uh unfortunately uh amanda and i just could not get our schedules to align so uh we are pushing that back a week but there is some levier news and we will be talking with her about this uh if you've not seen it she's announced her retirement uh so on social media this week she did announce she was she was leaving um, thanked a lot of people, which, you know, obviously anyone who has made it to the professional ranks has a lot of people to thank. Um, and so I just want to say uh, congrats to Lev on an excellent, excellent professional career. Uh, it's a shame it's ending already, but, um, you know, she's moving on to the next phase of her life and uh, couldn't be happier to see what she does. So, uh, Lev, if you're listening, uh, of course, everyone here at Let's Go Blues Radio wishes you nothing but the best as you move, move forward into the next phase of your career. Um, We're rooting for you, no matter what. So we will talk with Lev about that next week. So make sure you tune in for that one. Uh, But on today's show, I'm joined by Haley Taylor Simon of of the Locked On Blues podcast. And uh, she's also a reporter for Philly Sports Network for the Philadelphia Flyers. Um, We discuss Haley's desire to cover the Blues and, and where her love for the team came from. She's actually got deeper roots uh, in the blues than I actually originally had thought. Uh, so you might want to tune in for that and, 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 well, stay tuned for that because uh, it's, it's actually quite the uh, interesting story to hear about uh, blues fans from across the country. Uh, and then uh, we also talk about how similar the blues and flyers actually are at this point in time. They were both very close. They were bubble teams uh, making the, uh, the playoffs this year. So or, I'm sorry, last year. Uh, so we talked about that and how it was – Kind of odd how she covered two teams that were so similar to each other, both in a rebuild, retool, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we also, of course, get into depth on the moves the Blues made this offseason, 
plus the kind of content you can hear from let's I'm sorry, uh, Locked On Blues. Uh, and then at the end, we also play with a, a trivia game uh, where you may learn something. So uh, stay tuned for that one. That was a lot of fun to do. So make sure you stay tuned uh, to hear more about uh, Haley and her uh, uh, Locked On Blues podcast and what you can hear from them if you pay attention to other blues podcasts other than Let's Go Blues Radio, of course. Uh, so something actually we have not mentioned on this show that I thought uh, we should probably at least draw attention to. It's kind of a big deal. Um, But with all the player signings and the trades that happened um, right as the trade deadline, I'm sorry, the uh, free agency opened, uh, we kind of overlooked the coaching news that happened uh, right before, I think it was June 27th was when this man was hired. Uh, We never mentioned that Claude Julian was signed as an assistant coach, and he's going to help mentor Drew Bannister and his coaching staff. Uh, Claude Julian, of course, uh, Stanley Cup champion from 2011 with the Boston Bruins. Um, He is 64 years old, and he said in a uh, story written on uh, the Blues website uh, that he relishes the role of mentor. Um, He does have a younger coaching staff that he's joining. So, of course, we mentioned Drew Bannister, um, but we've also got associate coach Steve Ott, who's 41, assistants Mike Weber, who's 36, Dave Alexander at 42, and Michael Babcock. I didn't even know this. He was this young. Uh, He's 29. So, Claude Julian stepping into a very young uh, coaching staff and being able to mentor them, rising that median age quite a bit. Uh, but uh, I think it's a good hire, actually. Um, I was not a fan of the Craig McTavish hire a couple of years ago because, again, it's like you've already got Drew, um, I'm sorry, uh, Craig Berube. So it's why do you need another older guy to get in there? And yeah, it didn't make sense to me. And obviously, it did not work. He even had his power play duties taken away after a, like a month. Um, but I, this one actually makes sense to me because you have a young coaching staff and you've got a guy who knows how to win. Um, he is a great. NHL coach had a lot of success at the NHL rink. So I think this is a great hire for the Blues. Again, this happened a while ago, about a month ago now, but I uh, thought we should at least mention it since uh, we did overlook it with all that player news that came out uh, the uh, show after uh, Claude Julian's hire. Um, other quick news I want to mention just because it is relevant to Blues fans. Uh, the Blues did announce a transfer of partial ownership interest. David Stewart uh, was an original member of Tom Stillman's group that purchased the Blues in 2012. Uh, He has completed the transfer of his partial ownership stake to Michael W. Riney, a lifelong St. Louisan. Uh, Riney is the founder and managing director of QRM Capital, which he runs with his wife. Oh, I'm going to butcher this. Kyrsis? Q-U-I-R-S-I-S. That is an interesting name. Uh, I'm going to go with Kyrsis. Uh, QRM Capital is focused on private investments and philanthropic uh, endeavors in the St. Louis region. Michael and Kyrsis are active supporters of numerous local civic organizations. In addition, Michael serves on the boards of Washington University, the Danforth Plant Science Center, and the Missouri Botanical Garden. So fully uh, enveloped in the St. Louis community. So it's nice to see that uh, local ownership continues. This is not... A, um, yes, it's a very minor stake in, um, in their ownership, but it is still a very local group. So uh, that is the positive news here of this transfer. It doesn't affect a thing for Blues fans or even the Blues players, but uh, again, something I thought we should at least mention as we are a Blues podcast. And we are in the end of July. Let's talk about any news we can with the St. Louis Blues at this point, right? Uh, well, when we get back, we will talk with the host of the Locked On Blues podcast for the Locked On Podcast Network. Uh, That is Haley Taylor-Simon. So if you're not listening to her, here's your chance to hear what she has to offer and uh, maybe add another show to your blues show list uh, as you listen in the summer, too, because she is still going every day with the show as the Locked On shows work. So if you're not getting enough Let's Go Blues Radio, maybe that's something for you to check out. Uh, well, we will uh, take a break here, and the next thing you will hear is me and Haley on the other end of this break. You are listening to Let's Go Blues Radio. We'll return after these messages. As a hockey player, Mike Burgoyne knows a thing or two about making the perfect play. 
And when it comes to real estate, he's always ready to score the winning goal for his clients. If you're a first responder, a veteran, a doctor, a nurse, a teacher, or a Let's Go Blues radio listener looking to score the home of your dreams, you'll receive special rates with Mike. Go ahead, shoot some questions his way, and he'll have the answer quicker than Curtis Joseph on a breakaway. Curtis Joseph got the pedal down! Any barriers? Mike will mow them down like Chris Pronger in front of an air. He'll score you your dream home or sell your existing home faster than a Brett Hall one-timer. Put past the Hall. He shoots. He scores. See Burgoyne's real estate prowess in action today by emailing him at mike at strikeofmike.com or by calling 314-753-4060. That email again is mike at strikeofmike.com and that phone number is 314-753-4060. Getting Mike Burgoyne on your team will be the boost your power play needs. Well, honey, I just priced the power washing for the house, and I think we should just move and condemn this place. It'll be cheaper. Did you try Wolf Power Washing? Who? Oh, I just saw this guy win the Stanley Ponder Cup Memorial Tournament and thought he was attractive, so I looked him up on social media, and it turns out he's the owner and proprietor of Wolf Power Washing. He claims he has the best prices in town. But does he use non-flammable, non-toxic chemicals that are safe for Wolfie and our son, Little Magnus? Yes. He ensures there'll be no residue left behind, and he doesn't use any volatile vapors. Well, this fella sounds like a dream. I just wish I knew how to contact him. Oh, I know how. You can reach him at 314-420-5434. 314-420-5434, and his name is Joe Wolf of Wolf Power Washing? That's right. But how did you know his number so quickly? <laughs> I'll never tell. <laughs> Wait, what? That's Wolf Power Washing at 314-420-5434. And make sure to tell him Let's Go Blues Radio sent you. And now, back to Let's Go Blues Radio. The longest running St. Louis Blues podcast with Pr- Pr- Price, Ponder, and Day. All right, we're back from break, and I am happy to be joined by Miss Haley Taylor Simon. She's a credentialed reporter for Philly Sports Network, covering the Philadelphia Flyers. And the reason she's on the show, she's also the host of Locked On Blues, part of the Locked On Sports Podcast. Uh, you've you've heard of them, I know, because they've been around for a while. But uh, Haley, thank you very very much for coming on today. Looking forward to talking some Flyers and Blues hockey with you. I'm so excited. I love hockey and it's like the off season. So anytime I get to talk hockey, it just makes my day. Yeah, it's funny because and and I know you have the daily show. So you, you know, have to you have to do your show. But like we always keep it going all summer. And uh, it's funny. People are like, who's listening to Blues Talk in August? And I'm like, why don't you ask the listeners who are keeping me doing it because you are listening? (laughs) <laughs> oh, no, it's the best. And every single day I look forward to talking about the blues. And sometimes it's conversations that seem like a little kind of out there. Like on my episode yesterday, I did which player on the current team do you think has the most St. Louis pride? A topic I would never talk about during the season. But during the off season, it's like a fun little thing to kind of dive deep into these players. So any blues talk is fine with me. Yeah, uh, my answer is Oscar Sundquist. I knew that somebody was going to say that. Nobody said that in my comment section. Now, obviously, I had to go the natural route of going with my captain, Braden Shen. But I also had Robert Thomas just because he's a staple of the team. And I think he is not leaving anytime soon. But you could even make the argument, too, for Jake Neighbors, Banner, lots of guys. Yeah, I I just say Sunquist because apparently he is a massive soccer fan. So. He was going all the soccer games even before he was signed last year. And it was like, okay, this guy loves St. Louis. Bring him back. So, but yeah, I'm with you. Braden Shen clearly uh, seems like he loves it in St. Louis. Remember there was talks after the cup win that uh, he was going to go somewhere else. And then he signed whatever his deal is now. I think it was a six year, seven year deal to stay in St. Louis. And it was like, okay, clearly this guy wants to play here. And you got to love that. We always say here in St. Louis, you know, because there was a period there where it was like nobody seemed like they wanted to come here. The Blues were rebuilding. But now it's like we're a hockey city. And so it's yep. awesome to see these players who want to be here and want to stay here. And that's what makes the team special. I mean, I was talking about, too, the culture that the St. Louis Blues have versus other organizations. And there's not a lot of organizations where players genuinely want to be with the city. 
and you take a look back to some of our alumni, a very notable alumni, Keith Kachuk, who has his whole entire family here in St. Louis, which we saw with Matthew bringing back the cup. So I think that there is a certain pride that these players do carry when they become a blue. And I think that's something that's really special and makes some of these younger guys want to stay here long term. Yeah, and it's nice because you have that mentorship. Uh, something we've talked about a lot on this show is a lot of alumni are out coaching our youth right now. And yeah. so it's really cool because you see, I mean, look, you're seeing that the the uh, fruits of the labor right now with, with so many St. Louisans in the NHL. And a lot of it has to do with these guys who are sticking around and helping coach a lot of these players. You know, Logan Brown, was was a guy that was coached by his own dad. You know, the Kachucks were here coached by a bunch of blues of alumni. And it's just it the, the names go on and on and on because these guys love it in St. Louis and and you got to respect that because, you know, we're we're a, a flyover state, right? In yeah. Missouri, but like for some reason there's just this love for hockey here in St. Louis and the the players and the former players all know it. And exactly, and especially at um, player development camp, we saw now Brian Elliott, a former Blues player, come back, and he did an incredible job from the clips I saw of him teaching these young goalies. But it's funny that you didn't mention that, saying, oh, well, it's a flyover state. But I feel like one of the things about St. Louis that really makes it stand out more so than any of these other cities, and it's a shame because I know that, you know, our football team went away. Very annoying about that. But... <laughs> Uh, go Battle Hawks. But yes. I feel like the main focus besides the Cardinals and soccer is the Blues. And I feel like that's one of the number ones. I mean, the Cardinals have been such a good baseball team, too, throughout the years. So it's nice to have a consistently good baseball team. I mean, right now they're going to battle it out and hopefully get on top of the Brewers. But um, when you have a hockey team that really is the heart and soul of the major sports in your city, it's going to make the passion even more so than these cities that do have these big football teams because football, and I know you and I don't think this because we're both hockey people, but football is number one when it comes to sports that people are most interested in. So not having the Rams actually, I think benefited the blues. And that's my conspiracy theory. I agree. I actually agree with you. I think once the Rams left, it kind of made St. Louisans realize like, we've got teams that want to be here. Like we should support them and not say the blues weren't supported before because they were, but I feel like there was a little bit more pride and love for the blues. And so clearly going on to win that Stanley cup helped, but you know, having the, the, the love and the support of the city is just something that the players have always talked about. That is just so much fun. I mean, I hate to bring up the negative side of it, but the whole Jordan Cairo thing that happened this year with Craig Berube you saw how much it affected him. If a player didn't love where he played, he wasn't going to be in tears after the game because he was getting booed. It would be, ah, well, screw those fans. That is not the reaction he had. He was reacting that way because he wants to be here and he wants to be loved by the crowds. And, you know, so for the moment that it didn't happen for him, it was just such a shock because that's not normally how St. Louisans treat their athletes. No, not at all. And that was one of the examples I did bring up on my show because with Jordan Cairo, and this is the interesting thing about him, he is a good player. He may not be the best player, but he is good. He's improving. I mean, I I really am a big defender of him. I think that he made a comment that he shouldn't have made, but he did take accountability. But when you have a fan base, and again, I remember that game like it was yesterday, booing you and all that negativity, um, I have never seen a player that emotional after a game um, due to the fan base because you have your home team fans booing booing you. So um, if he didn't want to stick with St. Louis, he would have tried to get out of his contract and be traded. Like there's very few players I think that would actually stick that whole situation out in the entire NHL. I mean, you have Kane, Evidender Kane, who everybody hates, and I'm using him as an example. At this point, he's so used to it. He's used to people not liking him. But I don't think that it was the fact that maybe the Blues fans didn't like Cairo. I think that he realized that he wants to be here. He doesn't want to go to another team. And that maybe hit him like, wait, am I going to be on the chopping block because the fan base hates me? Right. So I think that it just shows that he is a true Blue player. I think that he wears the blue note with pride, and I think he responded really well to the whole situation. 
Hundred percent. I I said that's exactly what I wanted to see him. How I wanted to see him respond because it it real it it really did show that it hit him in a way that that was like oh uh, that this is a learning moment. Like yeah. I have to learn that there's there's some things and sometimes you can't really just speak your mind. I think he did the right thing. He handled it well. And then the next game, I think he came out and scored two or three goals. And uh, the crowd was going nuts for him. I think he got a standing ovation. So yeah, he um, did. clearly. He got- Start of the game, it was really cool to see the response that he had. Yep, he said 100%. that he did it for St. Louis. I remember that he was talking to Jamie Rivers after the game, and he said, "This is for you, St. Louis." So, yep. just that was a great. Cool I was I was at that game, and yeah, I was the same way. I was just like, you know, good for him. Like, yeah. good for him. We were all mad at him for a little while, but guess what? We all made up already. This is great. <laughs> That's how it goes. Um, Yep, that is. So, uh, again, so uh, you are based in, you're actually in Philadelphia, correct? Yes. So uh, how often do you make it out to St. Louis? I am going out. I believe it is going to be end of November, and then I'm going to try to go to the Winter Classic this year. So last year, just due honestly to flight cancellations because of weather, I was going to go out in the middle of the winter, and uh, that didn't end up happening. But I'm going to try to go at least a couple of times a year back in West Virginia, though, where I used to live, I would end up going out like once a year. So. Great. Um, so what, what's your ties to St. Louis? I mean, clearly you, you have an affinity for the city. Uh, what, what is that? So it's interesting. So when I was out in West Virginia, I have a West Virginia shirt on now. Actually, I didn't realize <laughs> that. Um, everybody in West Virginia is a blues fan. And I even told the Blues media people at the draft, I'm like, this is a thing. Like, every single person, you would think that they're Pittsburgh fans because of how close they are. It is truly the St. Louis Blues out there. So I spent a lot of time just around Blues fans all the time. And I think even growing up, I mean, Keith Kachuk was one of my favorite players. And different players on the Blues, like Pronger, there were so many guys I really did gravitate towards. So being out in West Virginia, I'm like, wait, these are the same guys that I like to watch play hockey. So... I really was just able to embrace my fandom. And then when they won the Stanley Cup, it was really cool because, again, the whole origin of how Gloria came about was here in Philadelphia. So there was just so many Blues fans all over me, and I was truly just able to embrace the fandom at that point. Yeah, um, I'll tell you, just from knowing our analytics of this show, I think, I could be wrong, but I think West Virginia is the third largest uh, listenership we have. Yep. It's Missouri, Illinois, and I believe it's West Virginia. And I remember when we saw that, we were like, what? <laughs> and and then we like kind of thought about the geography and we're like, are we the closest team? I mean, we're kind of close. I mean, I guess Chicago's in there and maybe Columbus, but yeah, just very strange. Yeah, Columbus is definitely the closest team besides the Penguins, but the thing is, I don't know what it is, but we all just like the blues. <laughs> I can't explain it. It's so weird. I mean, we hate Chicago. We're the same as everybody that lives out in St. Louis, where we hate Chicago. We love the blues, and that's it. I don't know I, exactly why it happened, but like I'm thinking back. My one friend in college, I will never forget this. When Colton Pareko came on the team, he got a Colton Pareko sweater. And everybody was like, oh, dude, this is so sick. This is so cool. And somebody was like, how did you become a Blues fan? And he was like, well, we've always been Blues fans here. And I will never forget that. I'm like, wait, like, it's just a thing in West Virginia. So maybe Very it's like interesting. Country roads at the game versus country roads in West Virginia. It could be that we have the same colors. I don't know, but it's a thing. That's a good point with the country road songs. People here that that want to poo poo it say it's a West Virginia song, and I'm like, yeah, but, but we're fans song. of the blues. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, that's good to hear. Well, there you go. I didn't know you had that tie in. That's that's fantastic. And yeah, those teams in the early 2000s. That's who I grew up watching. You know, the Pronger, the McKinnis, the the Kachucks, the yeah. Turjons, the Demetras. The when he yeah, went to I, Arizona, by the way, when Keith Kachuk ended up going to Arizona, I was so upset. Yeah, like yep. that broke my heart. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, he was yeah, but he came, he, he came right back. He, uh, he was yeah. very happy to come right back and finish his career here. And I as still love seeing, and, and I was at his last game, uh, as a, as an NHL player. And I still remember seeing, uh, Brady and Matthew come on the ice with them. Yeah. And so it's funny now to just look at it and be like, okay, one of these guys is a Stanley cup champion. The other one is a captain of the Ottawa senator. It's like, these guys are, you know, again, just that homegrown love for St. Louis. And, 
you know, they're always, and Matthew just came back with the cup. We saw a bunch of pictures with them all over St. Oh, Louis cool. with it. It's just really great to see. So next time you're in St. Louis, if you need uh, some advice on where to go, maybe restaurants that have popped up in the last couple of years, please reach out. Love to help you out because uh, we, that is one thing we love here in St. Louis is, well, two things, food and beer, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yep, that's that's what we're all about in the Midwest. Because <laughs> I feel like the last time I was in St. Louis, I went by myself. And I just remember trying to explore everything. And I'm like, okay, I'm a little confused. But now I feel like I can just hit you up and be like, hey, what do I do before the game? 100%. There are so many places to hit, so many great breweries that has have their own menus. It's, uh, it's fantastic. So, yeah, please hit me up. I will be glad to tell you where to go. Yeah. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask you, too, that, again, growing up in West Virginia, so we found out your blues ties. What uh, made you move out to Philly and, and kind of become a, a Flyers reporter? Yeah, so my parents are from Philadelphia. So after college, it was one of those things and just trying to figure out life about what to do. So I came to Philly, obviously huge hockey fan, obviously. Um and I began working at a radio station here in Philadelphia. And then eventually I began to cover the Flyers. So I began doing that in 2021, I want to say. So for two seasons, 21 to 22 was Flyers, 22 to 23 was Flyers, and then 23 to 24 was both Blues and Flyers. So uh, last year was the first doing two teams besides just covering a team and then being a fan of another team. I had to do both at the same time, uh, but it's been really cool. And whenever the Blues come up here to the East uh, Coast, especially, I'm able to go talk to the guys um, and cover them here. So it's been just like a dream come true doing like two of my jobs at the same time on those days. That's really cool. Yeah. And, and, and the fact too, that you're looking at the, when you look at the Flyers and the Blues, where they're at in their, uh, so in similar. the standings and yeah there's so many similarities it's so crazy to look at my tweets sometimes during like the season when things happen especially last summer with the trade between philadelphia and the blues with kevin hayes i was freaking out i'm like this always happens because ever since i began to do the daily blues podcast i feel like there's just been so much that's so similar i mean both of these teams were fighting for a playoff contending spot towards like the last couple of weeks or so. Then you had Kevin Hayes, of course, but then you also have Captain Braden Shen, who used to be on the Philadelphia Flyers. Like there's so many similarities. Craig Berube used to coach the Philadelphia Flyers. And then after he got fired from the Blues, he came back to Philly and I saw him in the press box the entire season. That's and great. I'm like, when worlds collide, <laughs> it yep. happens every time. But uh these two teams are so similar, but so different. I still believe to this day that the Blues really should have been in the playoffs last year, and it was their own fault. But yep. the Blues are a more talented team. So they have better players. They have a better opportunity with the coaching that they have. I really do like Drew Bannister's style now. And I just think that you have a team that with Philadelphia that's in a complete rebuild. And then you have a team of St. Louis that's just in a retool where they just need to tweak some things, but they're still a good team. I mean, I said this the other day, and it sounds really critical and harsh towards all the other NHL teams. They all judge the Blues, but the Blues have more Stanley Cup champions on their team than most other teams do. That's and true. That's fact. That is a very good point. Yeah, it, and, and it's funny because you look at some of the names on this team and and even guys that maybe were brought in this summer that there's veterans out there that, that are still contributing – very well. I mean, you can consider Pavel Buchnevich a veteran at this point, and he's a heck of a hockey player. Yeah. I think we all know that. Robert Thomas has hit, I think, veteran status. My and boy. You know, clearly Stanley Cup champion. Um, you know, and there's just other names that you just look at it and you're like, yeah, we've got these young guys. You know, everyone's talk about the Snugger Roods and, and uh, the um, uh, Dalibor Dvorskis, you know. <laughs> but really, this team has a lot of good and Pareko, a guy who had a great year last year. Yeah. Guys that can really step in and play good hockey down the stretch like they did, ex with the exception against San Jose, of course. Oh, my goodness. I cannot <laughs> believe they lost all their games to the Sharks. That is one of the most embarrassing things. And the entire <laughs> time, like, I just wanted them to win one game so I could be like, oh, how's the playoffs been since hand pass? Because obviously the Sharks haven't been in since then. <laughs> and I couldn't troll them. And that really bothered me. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, we uh it's funny because we we are uh, good friends with uh one of the the main shows for the San Jose Sharks, uh Teal Town USA. Great uh, guys, we love them. We have like a fun little rivalry, and so every year it's like, you know, we have okay, whoever wins the season series has to do this, whoever wins this game has to do that. The last season was rough. That was, that was very tough for us. It was so <laughs> bad. And I believe it was the final game that the two teams played each other. The Blues, I believe, had a 2 nothing lead, or they had a two-goal lead off the top of my head. And I was tweeting. I was trash talk tweeting. And it came back to bite me in the butt. I think I got 100 replies from San Jose fans. And I'm like, <laughs> who just won the Stanley Cup most recently? And apparently they didn't like that response. No, of course not. Um, yeah, and that's always my response to the Sharks guys is I'm like, hey, you know what? Who's got a Stanley Cup? You know, and yeah. but it's like, yeah, but let's talk about it right now. And I'm like, no, I'd really talk about 2019. They scare me now. If I'm going to be completely <laughs> honest with you, I mean, besides obviously Celebrini, and I actually did hear him speak at the draft. I went to the draft and I listened to him. And again, like these superstars, a lot of pressure, but then they did get my boy, Sam Dickinson, who I really liked out of the London Knights. So maybe in a few years, they'll be good again. Yeah, we'll but see. But I'm like, beat us three times, whatever. Yeah. We still are a better team. That, that was I mean, it, Even if you win two of those games, that puts you so much closer to a, to a Stanley Cup or to a playoff berth. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, oh my gosh. they were. The Go loss ahead. to the New York Islanders, by oh. the way, that will be the game, the worst game of the season for me. That's Why is that? Because coming out to the Metropolitan, they had to battle a lot of competitive teams, especially you look at the New Jersey Devils, who didn't pan out to be that well, but you had the Rangers. You had a lot of good teams out here in the Metro, and they had the lead, and they just played sloppy, lackadaisical hockey, and I believe that if they didn't go on that slump and they just continue to play tough and hard, they would have been in the playoffs. Yep. Something changed in that game. It was like some kind of demeanor, something changed. And then ever since that game, they just looked off to me. The most uh, annoying game for me actually isn't even against San Jose. It was the one right before the all-star break against Columbus. Oh my goodness. Three. Was it four <laughs> nothing, I think. And yeah. they just looked like they were so uninterested. Nobody was skating. Me. Yeah. And it was just like, and the guys, we are in a playoff race. What is happening here? Okay, you reminded me of that game. I think I probably blocked that game out of my head. <laughs> Most fans did. Oh, my gosh. Like, there were so many games, way too many games where they just looked like trash. They were slow. Mm -hmm. There was no fight. The defense was – they were having a tough time getting back, defending. Yeah, I just got all annoyed right now. See, this is how the podcast usually goes. I'm talking yep. about something. I'm happy. And then all of a sudden, I remember how the season went. And, yep. oh, and how, how we lost goes. against the Golden Knights. Like, they lost wow. so many winnable games, and that's what I'm saying. It's their own fault they weren't in the playoffs. They should have been. One of those Golden Knights games had one of the greatest goals that Jordan Kyrou's ever scored. Uh, yeah. He, I think he beat four guys and then came in on the goalie one-on-one -on -one and beat them. And I remember just – I think that put him up 2 nothing, another 2 nothing lead, and then they end up losing that game, I think 4-2. to two. And I was just like – Ah, uh, Kairou, that could have been the breakout moment for Kairou, but you lost the game. But here's a tendency I noticed with the Blues this season. Being up by two goals does it for them every single <laughs> yeah, time. The true. amount of games that they lost after being up 2 nothing or 2-1 is actually insane. Yeah. They agreed. need to maintain consistency. They need to learn how to maintain the lead. Yep. I hate always being the team, by the way, that has to come back from being down to nothing. That was the Anaheim Ducks all season. I've got a friend that runs the Ducks podcast, and I want to say they had like the most comeback wins out of any team from yeah. the first half of the season ever. And it was like, I mean, that didn't work out for them halfway through the season, but <laughs> it was like being a Ducks fan. I mean, you're probably down three nothing and you want to turn the game off, but you're like, there's a chance they're going to come back. I guess I need to keep it on. Like, that's so frustrating. I believe it was against the Avalanche when Shen and Boosh, they both got a hat trick that night. I want to say it was the Avalanche or the Lightning. It was one of, I believe it was the Avs. And yeah. they were up like seven something. And I remember thinking to myself, what if they blow this? And Season the whole, over. <laughs> and the whole entire game, like, I shouldn't have to think. If my team is up by seven goals, I think it was like seven to four, something like that. 
I shouldn't have to think, oh, they're going to end up blowing this. Yep. <laughs> yep. I just did not feel confident this season. Yeah, I remember at the, I think it was the opening of the third period, the Avalanche scored a pretty quick goal, and I thought, oh, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> Don't let this happen, please. Don't, don't do it. Oh, my God, God's, please. Yes. Uh, so I did want to ask you about, there's obviously the Blues have done some uh, movement this summer a little bit. Food um, some season. Of the, yes, some yeah, of the names yeah. that have come in, we've, we've gotten... <laughs> Right. <laughs> uh, so we've got Radic Fox, uh, the Joseph brothers, Alexander Texier, uh, Ryan Suter was uh, one of the more recent ones. And then obviously out Kevin Hayes and Marco Scandella. Uh, just comparing year to year, last year to this year, how do you think this team stacks up? I like this team a lot better than last year. I know I kind of just made a joke about Suter, but he is a good veteran guy. I spoke to some guys in Dallas that had a lot of positive things to say about him. But the Joseph brothers, they excite me too. Younger players, and I believe P.O., who is the guy that I'm most excited about, I think that he does have a lot of elements that will benefit the Blues, especially you have to look at the defense as a whole. It's going to improve greatly. Now, do I have some concerns? Absolutely. I think that maybe not going for a more well-known, skillful skillful, uh, player is a little bit of a mistake. But I can't hate this. They added just more deaf players into their roster. So it's a lot more than they did last season with just, you know, getting Kevin Hayes and bring back Sonny. I think that they truly did bring in players that not going to be in the first pair, not going to be first liners, but definitely going to be solid for the third, fourth line, and maybe that second and third pairing. Just we'll see where they fit in. But I'm really, honestly, though, here's the thing. I really love the Blues' first line. I wouldn't change that. The second line, you know, if I could tweak one player, you know who I would move out? I wonder if it's the same I would say. Let's see. Captain Braden Shen. Oh, okay. Where, Where would you put him? I would put him in the third line. Yeah, I'm with you. But the problem is, I don't think that they would do that to him. And I can't justify another player taking that uh, position. Yeah. I know that there are captains out there that do play in the third line. And again, it's not a negative. It just will benefit the team better. I just think that in order to do that, they would have to have bring in a player that has off star quality which some of these guys don't have, which is okay, valid. Yeah. But I liked when he actually played. Um, it was the most weird pairing, and no, people probably don't even remember this, but Kevin Hayes was on the left wing, and Shen was obviously center. And then I believe, who was on the right? Maybe they put... It wasn't Sammy Blay, was it? Maybe it was. I forget who was on the right, but it was like a re- it was only for like one or two games. I think that was the best that Braden Shen looked. Yeah, because they yeah, dropped I, him back. Yeah, I I like him as a checking center because he's yeah. he's. I mean, obviously, he's one of the uh, best hitters the Blues have had in years. And um, you know, and yeah, he's lost a little bit of the foot speed, but you know, he's still got hands. He can still contribute in the third line. I'm with you. I I look at it too, and I'm like, yeah, who's your second line center right now? And and just default, it's Braden Shen. I mean. Yeah. I guess in a pinch, a Radic Foxa could move up there or a Alexander Texier, but those guys are third and fourth Texier line players. Yet, though. Yeah, That's I don't either. Maybe this season, Bannister will see that maybe some of these lines should be changed. Maybe training camp will open his eyes up a little bit, but I, I just can't justify right now going into the season switching up the lines like that. You know, like, let's go say they actually brought in like a huge star player, which I said all offseason that they should do. I yeah. think that's more valid, but they didn't. So, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I think it's uh, right now it's a wait and see, right? For the Blues, I think it's like, okay, so the defense, we've got some contracts that are going to, the, the no movement clauses or no trade clauses <laughs> like are turning into, <laughs> yes, exactly. A lot of them move to modified. So maybe next season you can move a couple of these guys. But yeah, I think this is going to be another one of those seasons like last year. Like, if we make the playoffs, great, but that's not really the plan. So we'll see. And they need it to. is kind of it's kind of annoying being in that middle ground, right? I mean, you're seeing it right now with two teams. <laughs> but with the Blues, I am so frustrated because historically, and I, I'm like a crazy stat nerd. Um, okay, well, this is going to go back a couple of years, but on their 50 like, NHL anniversary, they only missed the playoffs nine times. 
Yeah. And they're a team historically that doesn't really miss the playoffs. If you're missing the playoffs for three consecutive seasons, then maybe it wasn't firing Craig Berube that was going to do the job. Maybe it wasn't eventually having Steen come in and be the GM. Maybe it's the fact that you just weren't aggressive enough during the offseason or trade deadline to get actual players that are not just lackadaisical on the ice. And Bob, I mean, oh my goodness. I like Tori Krug. I do. I do too. That contract, and I feel very bad that he's injured, but that contract was so stupid. Mm, not and a then, good one. And I get that they like some of these players. Like, they've been with the team. But you have to let guys go. Like, I, I can't stand Justin Folk right now, and it's no hate on him. Nick Letty, like, why? I agree. Nick and Letty it, was the one that really puzzled me because I thought when he came in, I thought, okay, yeah, he's a great – I mean, still to this day, great puck mover. Yep. But maybe even better than Pareko in that sense. But defensively, I feel like he is a disaster. Uh, Justin Falks took a huge step back last year. Maybe that was because of injury. We'll see what he does next year. Um, but yeah, I actually, Tory Krug's game last year, I liked it. I thought he played a lot better and yeah. I was excited to see how he'd take another step forward possibly this year. Now, I don't think he's ever, even if he does play this year, I don't think he's ever going to live up to that contract, but if he can play the way he played last season, that's at least like, okay, we're, we're getting somewhere with the second pairing guy, but who knows what's going to happen with that injury? Yeah, they set him up to fail at that contract, honestly. They should have just given him maybe like a three- to four-year deal, less yeah. money. And then I feel like the fan base would have actually supported him more so than how we all are just angry. Yeah. And yeah. him not wanting to move last season, I get it. Honestly, valid. Like, <laughs> I got his point loud and clear. I just think that um, the NHL has a hard cap. And it's really unfortunate that the Blues can't do more than they can do. Uh, but it is frustrating when you go from being a Stanley Cup championship team after being the worst team in hockey the majority of the season <laughs> yep. to then literally not making the playoffs for two consecutive seasons. It's uh, it's brutal. It's rough. And, and I agree with you on the crew contract. I'm actually okay with the money in term if you don't give him a no trade. And yeah. the fact that they gave him a no trade – was like, come on, like, you are just handy. And like you said, the whole defense has no trades. So it's like, you have got, you don't give yourself any flexibility here when you do that. So that, to me, is Armstrong's biggest mistake. But we'll see. I, I actually, I am I know a lot of people weren't. I don't know how you feel about the Ryan Suter signing. I like it, especially because I feel like they knew, probably, there's a chance Krug wasn't going to play. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't just sprung on him. So I think this is a good signing because he's a guy that can step in and, and help some of your younger guys that might be coming up too. He won't play more than 20 minutes a game. I think that, you know, he's going to probably be on the third or second pair. I don't think they're going to have him go on the first at all. But he's going to be mostly important in the locker room, and he's going to be able to, especially, as you mentioned, help the younger guys. But the signing didn't make sense to me at first. I truly didn't understand it now that you're bringing back um, Scott Perunovich, you're bringing him back, which I was surprised about, to be honest. Just yeah, me too. Like, oh, people got mad at me for being surprised, but I'm like, that was my reaction. <laughs> um, you have him, you have Tyler Tucker, who I'm a fan of, but I was surprised about Suter, but I think now it makes sense with Krug. I know we won't find out for six to eight weeks officially, but he is indefinitely out. Uh, not a bad signing, to be honest. It was quite a steal financially, too. No, and and I also figure that uh, maybe at some point this season he can be traded to Colorado and Utah, so mm. that way he can play for all the Central Division teams. That's so cool. <laughs> I didn't wait. I know. He does like to stay in the Central. I, I don't blame Apparently. Him. <laughs> it is funny, though. But I'm also another player that signed with a Central team, my boy Pat Maroon. I don't like yep. that he's with the Blackhawks. No one does. <laughs> that bothered me a lot. I saw that. And I was like, seriously, dude? Well, and going from Boston to Chicago, too. Like, come on, man. Like, you're just going on a tour of making people in St. Louis not like you. <laughs> well, the funniest thing is with Tory Krug, obviously, we beat the Black, uh, not the Blackhawks, the Bruins. I, see, I'm getting all mad about the Blackhawks. We beat the Bruins. And <laughs> we really did, like, outplay Tory Krug in every single way in that series. Yep. And then it's kind of ironic that then he's here now. And 
I just think it's kind of like poetic, but for Pat Maroon, I'm like, this is like the opposite of poetic. This is like how you repay us. The one season you were here, we got you the Stanley Cup. From yep, where you were from. Cool. I don't know if you can see it over my shoulder here, but there's the uh, the Bozak trip. Uh, I've got it framed over <laughs> yeah. there. Yep. Yeah, it's one of my favorite moments. I mean, I hate to say that, that it's one of my favorite moments because, I mean, obviously it was a very bad missed call. But, man, I, I, as you know, in Blues history, yep. how many shitty calls have gone against so the Blues? You know, it's like we finally got one that went our way. <laughs> the reaction, though, from all those Boston fans, I will never yes. forget that. They were so <laughs> mad. I remember something was thrown on the ice. Like, they were fuming. And I'm like, well, yep. you guys are scum. Oh, am I allowed to say that? Scum. You can say it. Say whatever you want. They were scumbags, those Boston fans. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> well, it's funny. funny. <laughs> Quick side story. So I work with a, a gentleman from Boston, and yeah. uh, he's a big Boston sports fan. And so I That's had to ask him, and I asked him in front of people who do not know sports at all. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I asked him, I go, do you consider yourself a mass hole? And everybody was like, whoa, why'd you say that? And the guy was like, no, I'm not. He's like, I'm not like those normal Boston fans. They're like, everybody's like, you, you're not offended by him saying that to you? And he's like, no, because mass holes, those are Boston fans. Yep. And I'm like, thank you. You agree. And he's like, yeah, most of them will gladly tell you they're mass holes. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true and they were not classy to us whatsoever when we won no it was not the sportsmanship that you would expect to see after a team wins a stanley cup for the first time in franchise history yep. i thought maybe a little bit more respect i mean we took them to a game seven yeah and it was a heck of a series that was i, I know you lost and it sucks to lose when you make it that far but man i mean that was an exciting fun series for everyone i mean it they still say what it wasn't game seven, the, the most watched yep. uh, NHL game in the last 30 years or something. Yep. And that's the thing about it. I mean, honestly, that game seven, I'm not going to lie. I was sitting at home. My dad was sitting next to me and I couldn't move the whole game. Even though I know that we took the early lead. I knew that we were doing well. I just was like the Boston Bruins scare me. Yep. But um, I wish I could have been a little bit more enjoyful of the game. If that's a word I just made up, but I, I couldn't enjoy it. I was so excited, but at the same time, I was holding my breath. And then that yep. final minute when they were up against the boards, I was like, please don't do anything. Just let it. I mean, I know we had like a big lead, but the point is, it was a very exciting series. Uh, like Lila Anderson, uh, she is doing well now. Like everything about that series, just the Blues had a win. Yep. Yep, I agree. Yeah, and and uh, for me, I mean, it, it was the four. It was actually the fourth goal, which a lot of people were saying after the first period, they felt like they knew the Blues were going to win. Oh. for me, it, it was the fourth goal. It took that long before I was finally like, "Oh my God, we're going to do it! We're going to do it!" Like I looked at everyone around me, I'm like, "We're going to do it! We're going to do it!" They're like, "Yeah, we know. We've known for a while." And I'm like, "No, this is Blues hockey. You don't know ever." So Where were you when, you know, you watched that final game? I was lucky enough to actually get tickets to be in the, uh, the, uh, enterprise center. Yep. So that was amazing. That's yeah. We so sat, cool. we sat at the top or the, uh, bottom of the, the, the top tier, like yeah. the third row. And I mean, as you saw pictures of and videos of it was packed and it was the loudest. They weren't even there. It is the loudest I've ever heard in arena. I just remember being at home and I'm super, super, super superstitious. Like if I'm like watching like all the other games, I had to sit on the same exact spot, had to wear the same exact thing, nervous. And as soon as they won, most people would celebrate. I began crying. Yep. Yep. <laughs> like that was my first reaction was just to cry. And I don't think that, um, you know, when we went blues day, I always rewatch that game seven. It's like my tradition now. Every single time the final buzzer goes off, I just cry. Yeah. Yeah. For, so for me, I thought I was broken. I was, I think I was just so shocked. It's <laughs> yeah. like everyone around me is crying. I got my best friend with me. I've got one of my, uh, I got my wife with me. I got other yeah. friends with me. And like, we're all just like, they're all crying their eyes out. And I'm just standing there, you know, and <laughs> I'm just staring up. and, and they're like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, I don't know. Is this actually happening? And I didn't cry at all the first night. It wasn't until the next morning. Uh, I think it was the NBC Sports app. Like, watch the whole coverage of the Stanley Cup celebration. And it was like the last 
10 seconds of the game. And then you see all the players, the minute the buzzer went, I just burst into tears and I'm like, ah, there it is. There okay. It is. I am human. I was watching them <laughs> celebrate. Oh my gosh. And even Gary Bedman being like in St. Louis, you know, you finally did it. And then when he got Alex to come up and he like hoisted the cup and oh. it's still so hard to watch. Um, even, you know, what's funny though, when I know the Knights won um, a couple of years ago and I, I didn't have the same emotion that I did though, seeing um, Vladdy win with the Panthers this year, that yeah. hit me hard. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was awesome to see him do it. And again, Golden Knights, I, I, I'm not a Golden Knights fan. I was happy for Petrangelo and Barbashev, but I was like, eh, eh. I for think Vladdy, I was like, thank God, I'm glad he won a second one. And how about that? Uh, another one with a franchise that never won it before. Yeah, two. Yeah, because then you had the Knights when their first one. Then you had the Panthers when their first one. And yep. our guys, maybe it's the former Blues players on that team that just bring good luck to your first time, you know, cup winning franchises. There you go. Except you go. I hope the Kraken never win. <laughs> Why is that? You hate the Kraken, huh? I do. <laughs> is there it's a reason ironic for it's our first you know game of the season but i yeah. hate our day game but i really oh. hate the kraken i think that everything about that franchise just rubbed me the wrong way <laughs> is there a reason behind that i think the ownership honestly um yeah. and how they kind of came about i also blame the nhl for just i know they want to push that because they want to get fans out there in seattle but they never would post to us here in St. Louis. Like the NHL never really went out of their way to promote the blues. Mm. And we see how they are with Chicago. We see how they are with the stars and all these other teams, the Rangers and the blues, I feel like always get neglected. So I feel like maybe it's this resentment towards the lack of interest that they have in us. Yeah, maybe that's it. That might be it. That's a good call. Um, well, uh, I did tell you before we got started here, Haley, that I had a game for you. We've yes. been doing this all summer with our guests. We've been trying to play a different weird type of trivia game. Uh, this is one that is very much related to you. Did it happen in St. Louis or Philadelphia? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. So I have got 10 uh, different just random events that have happened over time. And you need to tell me, did it happen in St. Louis or Philadelphia? You all ready right. to play? Let's go one for ten. How are you a history buff at all? Somewhat, somewhat. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> okay. I feel Let's like see I how we do, do here. <laughs> all right. The first one. This city was founded originally as a French trading post by a trader named Pierre Laclede. St. Louis. St. Louis. That is probably the easiest one I'll give you. Just to let you know. <laughs> one out of ten, baby. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, the first free kindergarten was founded in this city on August 26th, 1873. St. Louis. That is correct. Uh, just, I'll, I'll provide a little background on some of these. The first free kindergarten in the country opened in Carondelet. Susan Blow taught the children in the morning at the DePere School while educating the teachers in the afternoon. Within 10 years, every public school in St. Louis had added kindergarten school districts nationwide followed suit in the coming decades. I didn't know that. That was one oh, that I, I learned today. I thought that. So mm. obviously I've been looking to maybe potentially relocate one day to St. Louis. Yeah. And I know that St. Louis does have very good schooling out there. So that was my, because Philadelphia, they don't. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was what I guess that. Well, there you go. You got it right. So you're two for two. Let's keep going. Uh, the first music store in America opened in the city on December 13th, 1759. I want to say St. Louis because of all of our music history in St. Louis, but I'm going to say Philadelphia just because I feel like there won't be three St. Louises in a row. Well, you guessed correctly. Yes, because I would have thought St. Louis too, but it is Philadelphia. Opened by Michael Halagas. Uh, strict Calvinists and Quakers were opposed to the enjoyment and playing of music, which they considered a worldly amusement, and therefore it was unholy. In 1716, Quakers in Philadelphia advised members of the Society of Friends, quote, against going to or being in any way concerned in plays, games, lotteries, music, and dancing. So an entire shop that sold music, including ballads, carols, folk songs, hymns, and ribald songs uh, performed in taverns was a dramatic shift in beliefs and behaviors 
Among the shop's collection was secular music. So hmm, again, that? something I learned today too. So I, uh, I, I was, I was actually having a lot of fun doing this. I'm like, whoa, I didn't know that one. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. Yes. All right. So you're three for three, uh, three out of 10 so far. So number four. Better than the against the sharks. That is true. You're already better than the blues. Congratulations. <laughs> Uh, baseball's first official no hitter occurred in this city on July 15th, 1876. Oh, it has to be the Phillies. All right. And you are incorrect. Oh, it was in St. Louis. Wow. It was actually the Brown stockings. Oh, wow. this was way back. This was even before the St. Louis Browns. They were the Brown stockings. at Wow. George Bradley of the St. Louis Brown stockings. No hits the Hartford dark blues. Two to nothing. What a name of a t- of a team. Wow. The Dark Blues. The Dark Blues. Wow. Interesting. That's like <laughs> me watching the Blues at the end of last season. <laughs> dark Blues, yes. <laughs> All right, so you are three for four. Question number five. The first insurance company managed by African Americans, known as the African Insurance Company, <laughs> opened in the city on February 1st, 1810. Philadelphia. That is correct. Okay. Nice. No, <laughs> Total <please>. guess, right? <laughs> I don't know anything about insurance or anything. I just was like, you know what? Maybe Philly on this one. I didn't know that apparently Philadelphia is known for like the creation of insurance, basically. Really? Oh, well, yeah, it's what I learned today. Drive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Take that, Philadelphia. All right. Uh, so you are four for five. Uh, question six. The American Medical Association was founded in this city on May 7th, 1847. St. Louis, we have a good hospital out there. You are correct in that, but that is not the answer to the question. It is Philadelphia. Yeah. Wow. Who knew? Who knew? Wow. Yep. Uh, So you are now, what, four for six? Uh, This is question seven. The first Olympic Games ever played on U.S. soil was in this city on July 1st, 1904. I want to say Philadelphia because I'm going to stick with Philadelphia. It's probably incorrect, but. That is incorrect, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, it is the It was the third Summer Olympic Games. The current three medal format of gold, silver, and bronze for first, second, and third place was introduced in this year's Olympics. Um, and that was also during the 1904 World's Fair, which was in St. Louis, where the ice cream cone was invented. I knew that one. That one I that one I actually knew. That's a fun fact. <laughs> um, all right. So you are four for seven, right? Is that right? Yeah, four yeah. for seven. Uh, number eight. The first street cleaning machine in the US was used in this city on December 15th, 1854. So I'm just gonna say Philadelphia on this one. It is Philadelphia. That is correct. Okay. They always are cleaning right. machines out here. Yeah, I know. I know. I, I've been a couple times, and I'm like, Man, it's just are these things just running all the time. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Question nine: The first exclusively women's bowling tournament was held in this city on March seventeenth, nineteen seventeen. This is so St. Louis coded. That is St. Louis. You are correct. So you are now yeah. six for nine. Uh, it was uh, in 1907. St. Louis proprietor. Dennis J. Sweeney developed the first women's leagues and held the first informal national women's tournament. In 1917, the Women's International Bowling Congress was formed, and the first official tournament was held in Cincinnati in 1918. So very exciting. Very exciting for you bowlers out there. Uh, You ever bowled, Haley? You big bowler? Uh, Sometimes. You know, it's one of those things. I'm not good at it, so I kind of just ignore it. (laughs) Someone's like, let's go bowling. I'm like, oh, maybe not. Well, I'm not good at hockey, but I still play. <laughs> Hockey's different. That's true. That is true. Uh, all right. Last question. So you are, uh, what, six six for nine, right? Yep, six yeah. for nine. Uh, the first motion picture was shown to a theater audience in this city on February 5th, 1870. Philadelphia. That is correct. Seven for ten. Hey, that's passing, right? That's seven uh, for ten, so... Yeah, that's uh, on February 5th, 1870. Philadelphia inventor Henry Reno Hale uh, staged a demo at the Academy of Music in front of about 1,500 people. He had invented a device he called the Phasmotrope. The Phasmotrope was a geared disc loaded with 
uh, sequential glass slides. When spun in front of a lantern projector, it could cast a moving image onto a screen. Hmm. So hope you learned something, Haley. I, I learned a lot. This The whole ice cream cone being invented in St. Louis was my biggest takeaway. That's crazy. Yep. Yeah, that was uh, that was something that I remember you learning as a that. kid. You knew that. I did know that. Your head. <laughs> I remember learning that as a kid, just being like, what? We're known for creating ice cream? That's amazing. <laughs> uh, Haley, this this has been awesome uh, getting to talk to you. I I love watching you on social media. Uh, not to make that sound creepy, but no, <laughs> no, your social media is very active and very fun. Um, and uh, you've been an awesome guest. You do a great job with your uh, coverage of the Flyers over on the Philly Sports Network, and of course. Uh, Locked on Blues, which is a great daily show that you've taken over in the last little while. Uh, please let our listeners know where they can find your work and how they can interact with you on social media. Yeah, absolutely. So basically, want to talk Blues hockey with me. Best way to do that is on Twitter at Locked on Blues. I do reply to tweets, DMs, whatever, as long as it's Blues topics. And then on YouTube at Locked on Blues. So just honestly, if you just search Blues and Kevin Hayes, I should come up right away. <laughs> <laughs> Every tweet. Oh my God, Haley. Jeez. No. Well, the bad thing is during the season, I have a tendency to live tweet during games, and I had to stop doing it because every tweet would be so negative, and I'm like, oh, it's not good for the brand. Yep. That's you know, that's me too. I I actually last year told myself you're only going to tweet a couple times a period, yeah. And that way, it's and for because I noticed there's times too, and, and you're probably the same. You're sitting there tweeting on your phone or your computer, and you're like, shit, I just missed a goal. Yeah. You know, and it's like, I told myself, stop doing that. Just watch the game and an intermission, you can tweet away. But I'm so angry so many times during the game. I think need everyone to know my anger, my frustration. But yet like, when they do well, I don't tweet. Yeah, exactly. I'm the same way. I I had somebody once when I was in the media message me and say like, man, why are you so negative? And I'm like, because I did this wrong and that wrong. And he's like, yeah, but what about that great goal? And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I didn't mention that, did I? You know, and it's like, I should about, talk about all of it. I mean, you're always having to talk about the team. And, you know, for me, it's every day. I know like you're like all the time too. Um, Sometimes, like, the negative stuff, you just need to talk about a little bit more than the positive stuff. It just, if the team was really, really good and they went undefeated, 82 out of 82, we wouldn't have things to talk about. That's true. Yeah, like the old, uh, what was that, old Verizon commercial with the Washington Capitals going 82-0? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, reporters are like, same thing, Ovechkin scored three goals, <laughs> Capitals won. You know, I mean, <laughs> Every episode of Locked On Blues would be like, hello, welcome back. Yeah, we won. All right, see you tomorrow. Yeah, everyone have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow. We'll talk about the other win that we just had. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And they finally lose right. to the Sharks. That's right. Yes, yes. The, the, of course, the Blues will have to go 79-3 and three so they can lose to uh, the Sharks. <laughs> Makes no sense. Nope. Uh, Haley, thank you very much for coming on the show. Uh, again, Locked on Blues is your blues coverage. Please, folks, give it a listen. She does a great job. Uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. And, uh, hey, you're part of our little corner of Blues Nation right now. I love it. Got to have you on, too. Of course, for sure. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, again, I want to thank Haley for joining the show. Um, I actually never talked with her before, so this was uh, kind of fun getting to know her. And, again, like learning about – where her roots came from of being a Blues fan and, and I mean kind of even a Flyers fan too um, interesting West Virginia you know as I said uh, we've seen the analytics and West Virginia we do have some listeners there so shout out to our friends in West Virginia tuning in to Let's Go Blues Radio uh, very cool that uh, we have it's not a long reach uh, you know again we've had people email us from Japan um, uh, England uh, but still, really cool that, uh, you know, we're, we got such a nice reach over in West Virginia as well. So, uh, very cool. Um, obviously, Missouri, Missouri and Illinois, one and two. But uh, there's a couple. I think Arkansas is up there, too. So, Blues fans everywhere. Uh, very cool to see. Um, so, again, uh, next week, Amanda Levier will rejoin to uh, uh, to talk about her retirement, I guess, is what we're probably mostly going to talk about. But, of course, we'll touch on uh, her season with the PWHL, with the Minnesota team. Um, there's a lot going on surrounding that team, but uh, we will talk about 
uh, you know, whatever Amanda wants to talk about. Uh, Lev, as we all call her, uh, lovingly. Um, so make sure you tune in for that. Looking forward to talking to Lev again. Uh, again, not just a friend of the show, but become a true friend of mine through doing this show, which is uh, always always cool, uh, making friends from doing this show. Uh, so that'll do it. Support for Let's Go Blues Radio is brought to you in part by Mike Burgoyne from Real Brokerage Realty. Email him at Mike at strikewithmike.com today for all of your home buying and selling needs. That's Mike at strikewithmike.com. And by Wolf Power Washing, St. Louis's premier power washing company with the best rates in town. Call Joe Wolf at 314-420-5434 and get the best looking and greatest power washer in the area. That's 314-420-5434. Both of our sponsors have something to do with home buying, selling, home cleaning up. Maybe one of you could actually use both of them. Maybe you're selling your house and you need to do a power wash. Use both our sponsors. They're both fantastic people, and they're willing to work with anyone um, in the St. Louis area. So, uh, and hey, if you're not in the St. Louis area but you're close, still give them a call. Depending on where you're at, maybe they're still interested in helping you out. Uh, well, that will do it uh, for episode 41 of season 13 of the original St. Louis Blues Hockey Podcast. Let's go, Blues Radio. Thank you so much for tuning in, and have a great week, everyone. For Kurt Price and Bill Day, I'm Jeff Ponder, and I will talk with you next week. This was Let's Go Blues Radio. Until next time, everyone, let's go Blues. Uh, the Chiefs are at home tonight against Cyanusport at the War Memorial at 8. Good seats are still available. A look at sports. I think that went very well. Thank you for listening to Let's Go Blues Radio. Now take off, hosers. I want you to have a heart attack and die so that we never have to do this shit again. Well, there's 90 minutes of your life you'll never get back. Sorry. (laughs) St. Louis Blues, St. Louis Blues, have you heard the news about our St. Louis Blues? They've only just begun, they're on their way to number one, now there's no more blues for our St. Louis Blues. The blues are on the ice tonight again. They're rough and tough and got the stuff to win. They'll always get one more, no matter what the score. They are quite a hockey team, my friend.